A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Hear me, O islands. Listen, O distant peoples. The Lord called me from birth. From my mother's womb, he gave me my name. He made of me a sharp-edged sword and concealed me in the shadow of his arm. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me. You are my servant, he said to me, Israel, through whom I show my glory. Though I thought I had toiled in vain and for nothing uselessly spent my strength, yet my reward is with the Lord. My recompense is with my God. For now the Lord has spoken, who formed me as a servant from the womb, that Jacob may be brought back to him, and Israel gathered to him. And I am made glorious in the sight of the Lord, and my God is now my strength. It is too little, he says, for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will make you a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. I will sing of your salvation. I will sing of your salvation. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me and deliver me. Incline your ear to me and save me. I will sing of your salvation. Be my rock of refuge a stronghold to give me safety. For you are my rock and my fortress. O oh my God, rescue me from the hand of the wicked. I will sing of your salvation. For you are my hope, O oh Lord, my trust, O oh God, for my youth. On you I depend from birth. From my mother's womb you are my strength. I will sing of your salvation. My mouth shall declare your justice, day by day your salvation. O oh God, you have taught me for my youth. Until the present, I proclaim your wondrous deeds. I will sing of your salvation. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Reclining at table with his disciples, Jesus was deeply troubled and testified. Amen, amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another at a loss as to whom he meant. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter nodded to him to find out whom he meant. He leaned back against Jesus' chest and said to him, Master, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I hand the morsel after I have dipped it. 
So he dipped the morsel and took it and handed it to Judas, son of Simon the Iscariot. After Judas took the morsel, Satan entered him. So Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now none of those reclining at table realized why he said this to him. Some thought that since Judas kept the money bag, Judas, Judas had told him, buy what we need for the feast, or to give something to the poor. So Judas took the morsel and left at once, and it was night. When he had left, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and he will glory him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little while longer. You will look for me, and as I told the Jews, where I go, you cannot come. So now I say it to you. Simon Peter said to him, Master, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, though you will follow later. Peter said to him, Master, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Amen, amen, I say to the cock will not crow before you deny me three times. The Gospel of the Lord. Tomorrow is Spy Wednesday, and so tomorrow I'll deal with Judas. Today we need to deal with St. Peter. We have at the end of this gospel passage from John chapter 13, Jesus saying to Peter, will you, die for me? Will you lay down your life for me? I mean, I say to you, the cock will not crow before you deny me three times. And when you look at the life of Peter, this is rather confusing. Why would Peter fall to such a low to deny even knowing our Lord? When we re read the account of our Lord's uh, denial of Jesus, he will not just deny knowing him, he will call curses upon himself. In other words, saying things like, if I'm lying, let a curse be upon me. I mean, that's how far he goes in denying our Lord. And if you go back in Peter's life, it's rather you know, uh, odd of Peter to do, because Peter was one of the first of the disciples to follow our Lord. He left everything to follow our Lord. Even when our Lord called him in that big catch of fish on the boat, Peter dropped to his knees and said, Leave me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. And the Lord still said, Follow me. He left his boat, he left his wife, he left his home, he left everything. Actually, even one time he said to our Lord, We have left everything to follow you. So Peter had this intense love for our Lord. And let's not forget, it was Peter himself who answered our Lord when the Lord said, uh, who do people say that I am? And they all give all kinds of things that people are saying. Well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's when he got his name Peter, that upon that rock God will build his church. Historically, by the way, he was the first person to be called rock, just noting that fact. And upon that rock of Peter, God was going to build his church. So he was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, Peter did get in trouble a couple of times, right? Peter uh, did not like the fact that Jesus kept telling them that he was going to be crucified and in Jerusalem and so forth and handed over. And so Peter tries to stop it by telling our Lord he's not allowed to go to Jerusalem. And he gets rebuked and the Lord says, get behind me, Satan. And then Peter will try again on the Mount of Tabor when they have the vision of Jesus transfigured and Moses and Elijah is like, let's build three booths here. In other words, let's just stay up here because he knew they were heading down to Jerusalem. And Peter will try a third time in the garden uh, when he really takes out his sword and tries to fight to defend our Lord. But it is kind of uncharacteristic that he would, in fact, deny knowing Jesus because he was such a devout follower of our Lord. His faith was strong. So strong, he took a little stroll on top of the water with our Lord. So what happened? Well, you know I'm a big fan of Arch, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, and he, he draws out five things that Peter did that led to his betrayal. 
And there are five things that every Christian must be attentive to. Uh, when we hear of priests who leave the priesthood, or religious who leave religious life, or people we know who were once devout Catholics who walk away from their Catholic faith, Fulton Sheen points out these five elements are always there. He says the first thing that Peter did is he stopped praying. When did we see this? Well, after they left the upper room, they went out to the Garden of Olives, and Jesus says, stay here and pray. Pray that you do not enter into temptation. And what does Peter do? He falls asleep. Our Lord wakes him up three times. So when he should have been praying, he was sleeping. And Archbishop Fulton Sheen points out that whenever we fall asleep in our prayer life, in other words, remember we stop praying, that's going to be the first moment that the evil one's going to start using to begin to destroy our spiritual life. We need to pray, especially when it's a moment of temptation. I mean, think about this. Our Lord just told Peter that Satan was going to try to sift him like wheat, that he will deny knowing him three times and so forth, and then he goes to the garden and he falls asleep when he should have been praying. So whenever we abandon our prayer life, uh, that's the first sign that we are going to betray our Lord. The second thing Archbishop Sheen pulls out is that he turned to activism. So here comes the soldiers. They come in to rescue our Lord. And what does Peter do? Peter rallies from his sleep, pulls out his sword, and he starts trying to fight to defend our Lord with his sword. And Archbishop Sheen points out that what happens is many people become activists and not prayers. They stop praying first, and then they become activists. They're doing all these wonderful things. Uh, maybe they're doing great ministries, and they're doing great this and a great that, and, but yet they're not praying. They become activists in their ministry or activists in their life, and they're not praying. Just as St. Peter thought he was doing something wonderful with, for our Lord with the sword and being active to try to defend him, but was not praying. And so the activism that follows after the uh, falling asleep. And then the third thing that happens. So when Jesus is arrested, James, John and Peter follow. But it says very clearly in Scripture that Peter followed from a distance. He followed from a distance. So he stayed far back away from our Lord. And this becomes a third problem when one begins to fall away from Christ. We stop praying, we become, become activists, and then we start following our Lord from a distance. We're no longer modeling our lives on Christ. We claim to be followers of Christ, but we're from a distance. We're not truly working on virtue and holiness. We're not working on being with Christ, close to Christ. And so now we're a distance from Christ. So Peter's not praying. He tried activism, and now he's following our Lord from a distance at the time when our Lord needed him the most. He distanced himself from Christ, still following, but from a distance. And then fourth, when our Lord had told them to pray, and the Lord told them, to, told them the temptation was coming and so forth, he goes and warms himself by a charcoal fire. He turns away from a life of penance and turns to comforting himself. Right? Here is our Lord is arrested, our Lord is being beaten, and Peter is warming himself by a fire. And this happens in our spiritual life when we become slothful about a life of penance. We start relaxing our penances. We start giving into self-comforts, whether that's into comfy things or comfort food or comfort this or comfort that. <laughs> it all becomes about comforting ourselves and taking care of ourselves. And we become turned in on ourselves. And here St. Peter is comforting himself by the fire. Okay, so we have, he stops praying, he turns to activism, he's following Jesus from a distance, and now he's comforting himself instead of being with our Lord in the time that our Lord is being falsely accused and beaten. He's no longer close to the wounded heart of Christ. He's no longer close to the sufferings of Christ. And everything he had given up to follow our Lord, he's now turning back to in the comforting of himself by that warm charcoal fire. 
And finally, he's keeping company, this is Fulton Sheen points this out, with people he should not be keeping company with. Right? There's these women at the fire that he's comforting himself by. He's keeping company with these women. He was formerly married man and so forth, and now he's keeping company with these women. He's keeping company with the wrong people. Right? And then eventually they'll turn to him and ask him, aren't you one of his disciples? And then he denies it. Oftentimes what happens in our own personal spiritual life, when we stop praying, we turn to activism, we follow Jesus from a distance, we start comforting ourselves, and then we find the wrong people to be hanging around with. What's that great line, show me your friends and I'll show you who you are, <laughs> right? When we start hanging around with the wrong people who can influence us the wrong way, influence us away from the Lord. Influ not that we should not be having friends who might not be totally with the Lord, right? But when we start engaging and, and, and entering into that thought process that worldly people might have, it'll take us away from thinking with the Lord and we'll start conforming our lives, not to Christ, but to the crowd. To the world. When we follow or we stop praying, we're being active about so many things, uh, we're following Jesus from a distance, we're comforting ourselves, we start thinking worldly and we turn away from the Lord. And what happens when Jesus, when Peter is tempted? He swears and calls curses upon himself saying, truly, truly, I do not know the man. Right? So that was the downfall of Peter. These five points that Fulton Sheen points out, which I think are really good for thinking about ourselves and our own lives and our own spiritual journeys. I mean, whenever you hear of a priest falling away from the priesthood or religious leaving their vocation, or you hear about um, lay faithful who were very devout persons once and are no longer devout, you will find these five points. Are you praying? Are you turning to activism and keeping busy about so many things? even if it's for the good of the Lord? Are you following Jesus from a distance or are you seeking to be close to him? Are you warming yourself with the comforts of the world or are you living a life of penance and truly entering into the penitential life? And are you keeping company with those who are corrupting your moral or spiritual or theological life? Those are good questions to ask ourselves because they were the five points that brought St. Peter down. These are the five things that happen whenever anybody walks away from their vocation or they walk away from their faith. If someone said to me, Father, I used to be so involved in the church, and this, I was this, when did you stop praying, would be my first question. When did you stop praying? And then I'd ask, so what did you do for the church when you weren't praying? All the active things you did, oh, I was doing this, I was doing that, I was doing this, I was an extraordinary minister of the communion, I was elected, but were you praying? But I was doing so many good things for God. But were you praying? The activism. Were you modeling your life on Christ? Or were you following him from a distance? Well, you know, Father, life gets tough. That, that, yeah, but were you modeling your life on Christ? Or were you following him from a distance? Right? Were you living a life of penance? Well, Father, you know, I had, I had my uh, nice life. I have a nice life. It, it's nice, but were you doing a life of penance? Like our Lord said. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Right? Re repent, do penance, and believe in the gospel, where our Lord's words is first preaching. And then do you keep company with people who took you away from your faith? Anyway, these are five things that I thought were very good to point out about St. Peter today. Now, thanks be to God, Peter will have come back strong as ever, but he will never forget this lesson that he learned. Uh, Peter is very much humbled by this experience that he has. And we'll talk about Peter a little bit more tomorrow and his turning back uh, to our Lord uh, and what the difference was between him and Judas, because there wasn't much. But we will look at those two tomorrow and in their comparison of their lives. But today I thought it was good to point out these five things to reflect in our own lives uh, and how well we're doing uh, with prayer becoming too active or not doing the penance we should be doing and so forth just to really reflect upon those five points and to see how we could better uh, enter into deeper prayer, how we can follow our Lord more closely, 
how we can be peaceful about the ministry, that whatever work we do is coming truly out of a life of prayer and not just keeping busy like busy bodies, as St. James would say, <laughs> to make sure that we are truly following closely behind our Lord in a life of penance and living a penitential life and keeping good company, which means also reading good books, watching good movies on things that are truly holy. Right? Keeping company can also be reading bad books or watching bad things. That's also keeping bad company. Just thought of that just now, just pointed that out. So good points today to consider and think about and ask our Lord for that grace never to depart from him. That we ask for the Lord for the grace of prayer. Ask the Lord to give you the gift of prayer. It's a gift. Ask him for the gift of infused contemplation. Ask for the gift of prayer. Ask to be able to work for the Lord with a true acting and not an activism. Ask for the grace to follow our Lord closely in imitation of his life. Ask for the grace to do penance. Ask for the grace necessary to have those persons around you who will truly support you in living your faith and living it to the full. May God bless you and Mary keep you.